All right. Hey, everybody. I don't know how to make that. There we go. Hi. Uh, I'm glad to be here today. This is uh, just a few folks. Uh, first, we have Bob, who's the founder of Voice XP. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Uh, we also have Bob, who is the technical director of the Alexa Skills Kit. And for today, for this hour, just call me Bob, too. My name is actually Paul, but I think we should just all be Bob. Bob. Yes. Good. All right. We are here to talk about building more conversational natural experiences. So let's give you a little bit of a perspective first. Um, it feels like every decade or so, there's a new way to interact with your computing. Um, I remember teaching people, like literally prescribing people to play solitaire so that they could learn mouse skills. There was quite a disconnect between this thing on the screen is moving and my hand is moving, right? And it took a learning curve for people to get through that. Just a decade ago is when you first got the internet in your pocket. You like, have a phone, and it's got the internet on it. I can take it anywhere I want to go. This is amazing. And touch was there. And you're like, I can, I can scroll with my finger, and it was really cool. It was also a little bit rough in the beginning because do you remember all the pinching and zooming? Like every single website you went to was pinch and zoom, pinch and zoom, pinch and zoom. And everything, every link you tried to hit was tiny and didn't really, uh, wasn't, you weren't able to click it. And a lot of that was because what happened was the design paradigms of the web were just pushed onto a phone and uh, thought to work in the same way. But there is no such thing as hover. So all the coolest things of the day, like every website had these cool hover menus. You move your mouse over, it comes down. Well, you can't really do that on touch. And the designers at the time didn't really have the concept of, I need a seven millimeter tap target because our fingers are all so big. And so you have to make sure that when you click a link, you can hit that. Or another one that sort of was really, I guess, new for folks was the phones had way higher resolution than your PCs had. And when you're designing for a PC, you're like, if I went through the trouble to buy a really expensive big monitor, I'd better show my customers more stuff. On the phone, if you show them more stuff, it just means it's harder to click and you're more pinching and zooming. So eventually, the industry came together, sort of figured it out and said, ah, responsive design. This is what we'll do. We'll go figure it out, right? It took, a, it took folks building touch devices and also folks in the community to go figure out what this was about. And I feel like that's where we are today. There's this beginning, this start of something with voice UI, and there's been a convergence for a long time, actually, of a few different technologies coming together. Um, for example, one of those technologies is uh, the, the entire voice stack, right? Um, you've got natural language understanding. So this is where you can understand what people have said. Uh, speech recognition. So to literally take an audio file and go, oh, these are the words that are in here. Um, the microphone array, like the fact that you can stand across the room now and have a device with a seven microphone array around the top um, and, and it will literally take your voice from the microphone that your, your sound waves from your voice hit first and realize that's the direction in which to do a beam forming around. So it'll dampen down the sounds from the room with all the other microphones and then form a channel around your voice so you can just talk across the room. So those things all came together. Outside of that technology, there were a few other things that sort of have converged here. One was um, web services. It seems like everybody has a web service. And the thing that's really cool about that is folks like Domino's Pizza, for example, they built an Alexa skill. And you can now order pizza with your voice. And it turns out to be pretty straightforward because they had an API. I don't know why they built it. Maybe so you can order pizza on Twitter or whatnot. But the cool thing is now you can order pizza with your voice. So the fact that every cool thing that you can do, it seems, has an API makes it really easy to bring a new UI on top of it. Gee. It makes me think, software's eating the world. <laughs> Where have we heard that before? Quite literally in this case, I guess. So, so here we are. We're in this spot where there's this magical moment. And a lot of cool things are happening. You can turn on the lights, turn off the lights, order your pizza, play some music, do all these things. But we're still in that very, very early stage. And so our hope here today is to find that one or two or hopefully dozen, hundred people here in the audience that are going to help define the future of what voice could be and move beyond command and control and straightforward 
things like that, and come into more of a conversational kind of an experience. So we're going to show you today some of the capabilities that you'll have the ability to do with, uh, with voice, these conversational techniques. And I think we should start with some, uh, some talk from you. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, go back to the slide one more. I want to quickly add a, a, an idea to share with you guys. What do you think the next evolution after voice user interface is going to be? I, I'll, my idea is that it's going to be virtual reality and voice user interface because using your voice is the link to the outside world so you can do things. So for what that's worth. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Bob Stolzberg. I'm the founder and chief innovation officer of Voice XP. We are so proud to be an Amazon recommended agency. We develop enterprise skills for businesses and brands, and we've been called one of the most innovative tech companies out there for what we're doing, and we're one of the highest rated because we provide a managed service around skills. Like for some of our con uh, customers here, CenturyLink, they deployed the first Alexa marketing campaign in a box to enable their sales force and their partners to communicate their message and products and services in a different way, in a better way. Uh, Chingy, raise your hand if you guys know about Chingy. Wow, I see a couple hands out there. Chingy was the first artist, a platinum recording artist, to adopt an Alexa skill. And this is going to disrupt the entire music industry. Because think about it, how do you get your music right now? You have to go on your phone, you have to type on something, maybe you've got an Amazon device and you can engage with a streaming service that you pay money for. Well, this Chingy skill allows you to do something so simple to just say, Alexa, ask Chingy to play the new single. Alexa, ask Chingy to play the new video. It's also a very conversational voice experience engaging with that artist so you could figure out what the tour dates are, the booking, all sorts of facts about the artist. But why this is so important is because users, fans, just have to ask to get this knowledge, to get this art and entertainment on demand straight from the artist. So Chingy says to us, listen, I don't have to pay Google and Spotify and iHeart and all these places I used to have to pay to get my music distributed. Now my fans can just go straight to my Alexa skill that he uses through Voice XP as a software as a service. We upload his content and maintain it for him. He's putting it out there. Now, I'm sure you've learned that you can now monetize Alexa skills. So what we're rolling out is the fan club. That's just basically a subscription service that if you're a paying member, you get access to all the content. So why the streaming services are so worried is because you, the fan, is gonna pay the artist the $10 a month to get access to the music they like, they listen to, that you want to get exposed to, instead of a computer-generated algorithm of other people's tastes. You trust that brand better. Uh, First Integrity Mortgage, another great customer. They're rolling out a mortgage application skill so that you can apply for all that lending. Raise your hand if you've bought a home or have ever had to get you know, a mortgage. Wow, not a lot of hands. It's a really long process and you need to get information. They have a skill to help you accelerate that process. We're really proud to have worked with Arizona State University who had um, John Rome, the CIO, spoke this morning about Alexa in education. Props to ASU and the city of Phoenix for rolling out the first Alexa skill designed for the Echo Show to support their Amazon HQ2 RFP response. Imagine that. Amazon, come to my city. I made this awesome skill, and it's got video, and it's really, really engaging. So try it out. Uh, to start it, just say, Alexa, uh, enable, choose Arizona. So, guys, this is such an exciting time to be in technology. It's, it's like Paul was saying, it's web applications and APIs, but there's so much more that goes into this. And it's just so exciting to be able to do these innovative things with our customers. Cool. Thank you. All right, let's, let's start diving into the conversation components. I'm going to give you this. All right, awesome. Which one do I hit to go for? Uh, Big green one in the middle. Yeah, so I'm Mother Bob, and uh, director of the Alexa Skills Kit at Amazon. So we're going to talk about some of the things that Paul mentioned when uh, we introduce new sort of mediums to allow people to interact with compute. It's hard. You have new UIs to build, and so you have to think about how to do that. And you have to think about how to do it so that it's usable and intuitive for the user. And so 
we're building conversational UI. So let's talk about conversation. Conversation has been around for forever. And we, we all learn how to talk at some you know, point in our lives, and we've all gotten pretty good at it. We can carry on a conversation with each other. We typically know what the other person's saying. But then think about what happens when you don't actually understand maybe the other person who's talking. And maybe the reasons why are because there might be uh, a different accent maybe, or maybe somebody's using slang, or there's a couple words you don't understand, or maybe there's a different dialect. And so it becomes a little hard over time. And so now just imagine for a second that one of those human beings represented here is a computer. And computers haven't actually been talking for thousands of years like we have. And so now we have to teach the computer how to understand. And so the nice thing is, is that, as Paul mentioned, we're, we're in, uh, as we like to say sometimes, the golden age of conversational AI, because you have all these foundational technologies that have gotten really good, speech recognition, natural language understanding, but you still have to design the interface, and you still have to train the model so that once it gets plugged into all those mechanics, that it'll work. So the natural inclination for all of us as programmers is that we just like to kind of make our programming job easy. And so you might think, OK, cool, I'm going to go build a conversational UI. And uh, let's say I'm going to build a trip planner. And I need to collect a couple pieces of information from the user, maybe when, uh, when they're going to leave, where they're going to go, how long they're going to stay. And so the easiest thing as a programmer is just to go and just build an interface where you just collect it all right, right up front. We call that a one-shot invocation. And so imagine this user represented here is trying to speak, and all these things in the uh, parentheses or ellipses are uh, variables they're supposed to be telling us. That's, that's a kind of a high cognitive load. And so this poor person is just going to get confused over time. So that's where we've introduced a concept called multi-turn dialogues. And again, this concept has been around forever. When you talk to somebody, and uh, let's say you call the travel agent on the phone, you would have a conversation that would go back and forth while that person on the other end asks you questions about your trip. And so I'm going to step through what we sort of how we break this down in Alexa. This uh, just kind of the way this works is anything on the left here in yellow is something that the user says. Anything in blue is something that Alexa says through your skill that you're building. And so first thing that happens is you're going to invoke the skill. This would be like calling your travel agent. And so then the skill is going to say, welcome to Trip Planner. How can I help you today? And so then the next thing that you'll do when designing these conversations is to say something to the user to get them to start a dialogue with you. Where would you like to go? What kind of trip do you want to plan? And so now you're going to have essentially a back and forth dialogue where you're going to go and you're going to say, uh, where do you want to go? The user might say, Portland. Then you might say, when do you want to leave? Okay, so you're just kind of collecting information along the way, just like if you call the travel agent on the phone, they would do the same thing. This is a multi-turn dialogue because you're turning back to the user, back to the skill multiple times to go and collect all the information. And then at the end of it all, once you have everything that you need, then you can go and fulfill the request. And that's what we call intent handling. And so you have a goal essentially at the end of this conversation where you're going to collect this information about the trip, then you're going to go and call an API to fulfill it and then send a confirmation back to the customer. So a couple pieces on here. We call this concept of, and I'll, I'll break this down in a minute, but the values that we're trying to collect, we call those slots. And when we need to collect more required slots, we call that slot elicitation. And so we're going to do things that we're going to build into the model for the skill that will get Alexa's help to go and elicit those slots. And so uh, in this case here, we have a required slot, which is the city. We, uh, through Alexa, will send a hint back to the NLU. It'll go and collect the city. And then, if you want, you can also build into your model a confirmation for that slot. And so and this is the case where, it, where uh, the NLU, Alexa's engine, will automatically say, I heard Portland. Is that where you want to go? Yes, no. And so that's really useful for really important information. We don't use it that much because it'll add friction to the, to the UI, but it's, it's also very useful. And then again, you can do the same type of confirmation at the very end. So did I get all this right? I heard that you want to go to Portland next Friday. You're going to stay for four days, and you want to play golf. So this is what it looks like when you build the model for your skill. So um, how many people here have built a skill? OK, so you, yeah, nice job. Um, <laughs> So you've all built sample utterances. Uh, and so the, the whole idea is you're going to start from the conversational UI, which is writing your sample utterances. And then you're going to break down those utterances into slots, where each one of those slots could have multiple values. 
And so you might start by thinking, okay, I'm gonna, and this is now we're gonna switch over to a, like a pet match skill, where you might say one of the first utterances would be, I'd like a dog that's small, short-haired, and playful, okay? So then you might break it down and say, okay, the first thing I said was dog, that looks like an animal slot, and that thing could have a couple values, maybe dog, cat, bird. Then I'm gonna say that's small, that's a size. How many different values do I have for size? Now I'm gonna talk about the hair, fur, and those values can be long or short, and then uh, playful, we're gonna call that temperament. And so then, as soon as you build that, then obviously you can think about how users would say this, they can say it in a bunch of different ways. They could change the order. I'd like, I'm gonna say size first, then temperament, then animal, and so then it's a matter of switching it around. And so the, the model is as good as you train it to be, and then uh, you can improve that training over time, but you wanna be able to start with what you think the users are gonna say so that you can have a good enough representation in the model so that it can resolve to the things you're looking for. I wanna add something on that. You just said, you said the word training, which I think is actually pretty critical here. A lot of programmers will say, oh, size, tiny, small, medium, large, that's an array or that's an enum, that's the list of possible things I could say. Mm -hmm. But actually, if I said, I'd like a dog that's pizza, short-haired, and playful, pizza's gonna fit into there, it's gonna be close, right? So, because it's gonna get the rest of the utterances figured out, it's gonna, well, this is the best fit that we've got, and it's, it's gonna sort of slot it in there for you. So the key is it's training data. You're yep. training the NLU to get the best possible fit with the highest confidence. Um, and so we're gonna talk through ways to handle things like pizza and how we go through that. Yep. So with that, while you get your machine fired up, I'm gonna walk through one of the design patterns that we've uh, started to notice are changing. If you think about a web-based world or mobile-based world, there's this notion of a wizard. I have a set of things that I wanna get, and the beauty of this is you can really focus the customer in on exactly what they're supposed to do right now. I need this information from you, then I need this information, and so forth, and you can go on your way. And in voice, you could do the same thing, and in fact, most designers start in that same place. They build a flow chart, and it's got decision trees, and it's got places where you're gonna gather all the information, but it often breaks down in a very common place, and that is, let's go through the, uh, travel one, I guess. We'll go through the travel one. If you say something like, hey, where would you like to go? And then the customer says, I want to go to Portland on the 5th. What they just did is they over-answered. They answered where they want to go, but they also said on the 5th. And so it would be a pretty bad experience if the very next question was like, well, when do you want to go? Because that's how the flow diagram went, right? Uh, another example of this is you say, hey, where do you want to go on your trip? and the person says, I want to go hiking, uh, and I'm gonna leave from Seattle. Again, you told a couple pieces of information, but you didn't ask, actually answer the question at all. And that should be okay, too. And so, one of the things that you find happens very quickly is people can dive in at any point here. It's not like a regimented, wizardy flow. They can dive in at any point. And at its most basic level, that changes a lot of stuff, because if I can just say, I want to go hiking, whenever, you've pretty much changed the whole information architecture. So let me give you an example. Let's say um, I'm building a banking app. And in a banking app, I wanna look up my routing number. Maybe I wanna transfer some money or something like that. In a mobile app, you would do open my app, hit menu, 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 routing number, right? It should be kind of buried down in the information architecture. It's not worth ring zero UI or top level UI, right? Because you only have so many pixels to work with. In voice, it would be terrible if you said, open my skill and then go menu, 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 what's my routing number? Because you have to remember all the menus. Instead, you just want to say, hey, ask my bank what my routing number is. There comes back your routing number, right? So what we did is we just sort of switched that whole information architecture from a very deeply nested thing to a very wide top level thing. Our UI designers call that spear phishing. When you think about conversational AI or UI, it's like spear phishing. You can literally just say exactly what you want and get it immediately. You don't have to go through sort of all these different things to get yeah, there. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, Bob's about to build for us as we build out this experience is based on a frame-based UI instead of a graph-based UI. So there still will always be a bit of a graph, but if you can take whole chunks of your graph and turn them into frames, uh, you'll be in a much more conversational place. So here's how it works. There's an entrance criteria where it basically says, do I have enough information to start this line of questioning? Uh, in our case, for traveling, yeah, you just start right away. But if I was booking a ticket, then I would need entrance criteria that says, I have everything I need before I can start doing the booking process, right? 
Now in the frame, you basically just say, here are the slots that I care about. I have a set of required slots. So I want to know where I'm going, what I'm doing when I'm there, when I'm leaving, where I'm leaving from. And each of those has an associated prompt with it. And whatever you say into the system, it goes, oh, well, I've already got two of the three done. So I'll, or two of the four, I guess this is four. Um, so I'll come back and ask you for the next two. Right? And it won't bother asking you for the ones that's already figured out. And then once you've met your criteria, there's exit. You can exit out of this. So once I've got all the required slots, it'll go, cool, let me confirm it, whatever, and then move on to do the booking process. All right, so let's see how this works. I want, uh, I want to add something, though, if you yeah. could go back one more slide real quick. Um, this is the equivalent of designing a conversation in a Visio-type format. It's supposed to contain what it's supposed to do, not all of the content and the details, right? If you're in IT, you know you've got a run book with all of the content and the data you need. This is really to help design things at a high level, not deliver a finished product per se. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I'm gonna switch over and give a demo of what this looks like. So I've got this pet match skill, and uh, we're gonna go into the interaction model tab here, and we're gonna build, uh, actually I have a, I'm gonna get rid of this hello world intent, uh, and then we're gonna start and kind of think about what our, what our UI would be like. Yeah, so the first thing we need to do is we need to define our happy path. So this is the case where everything works perfectly. The person said everything they needed to do. They didn't try to trick us in any way or whatever. Right? Yep. So, uh, so here I'm going to create this um, pet match intent. And so now I'm going to start thinking about what, what, a what a user would say. So let's say I want a big, high energy, family friendly dog. I might say that. Or I want, can I? I want a guard dog that's medium and low energy. And then, right, so, so that gets you like the, the one shots that we talked about earlier. But we kind of know that most people, especially if you're not familiar with the skill, are going to actually do the whole one shots. So now we need to start to adding common variations. So I might say something like, I want a big guard dog. Maybe I want a high energy small dog. I don't know, maybe I prefer a high energy, uh, family friendly dog. So, uh, one of the things you think about in this phase yep. is originally the skill's gonna open up and it says, hey, so you want a dog. Tell me about, tell me two characteristics about your favorite dog or something like that. And then, so in that case, you're kind of expecting the person to say two, maybe three characteristics. So, you wanna capture those different cases. The first two that Bob did had all three. The next two had a couple, and he had a different few varieties. So I'll start putting slots into here. Yeah. Okay. Some cool. of these words like "high," like you might change that up. Yep. Uh, let me see. I'm just going to add one more because I'd like a big dog because I know sometimes. Right. Really simple. Yeah. Um, okay. So then I'm going to go through and I'm going to look at all these utterances and say, uh, okay, what what kind of slots do I have? What kind of information do I need to collect? Right now, we're not collecting anything. Right. So. So this one here is, is a size. I don't have a slot defined yet for size, so I'm gonna create a size slot. And we're gonna, over on the right here is the slot, and then there's also a type. I'm gonna go define the types in a minute, because then I can go and specify what are the values that I can have. So first I'm gonna go and I'm gonna look for all the different places where I might be using uh, size. Here's a small, that looks like a size. I want a big dog, that looks like a size. I want a guard dog that's medium, that looks like a size. Uh, let's see, I want a big, high-energy, family-friendly dog. Bob, can you type in an utterance now with size in it so you show you don't have to go back and fix it up all the time? Say it one more time. Just put the slot in as you're typing now with the brackets. And, and instead of large, just do... Oh, print. God, like this. Yeah, so you don't have to like go fix it up every time. You can just yep. put it in from the get-go. Yep. yep, yep. Cool? Awesome. All right, um, so you want to grab energy and... Cool, so let's see, energy. Uh, I want a high-energy dog. And then, um, again, I'm going to just go find uh, the places where I use energy. Good. Cool. Okay. And then, let's see, we also have probably temperament, because I'm actually looking for, do I want a guard dog? Do I want a family-friendly dog? And so, uh, here I've got uh, family-friendly temperament. And down here, I say I'm looking for a guard dog. Here, I'm looking for a guard dog. And that is also a temperament. Good. All right, so now you can kind of see how this gets 
more powerful because you're able to get all the combinations of the different things in this situation. So you're gonna go through and define the slot types? Yep. Okay, right. so now I, I wanna go pick types for these. And so I have a bunch of values that I can choose. Um, there are, you know, if I'm looking for a city or region, there are a bunch of built-ins. However, in this case here, like dog, we could have used animal, for example, if that's something we cared yep. about in this skill. Um, actually, I need to make my screen smaller just for one second to get size type. Okay. So in my size type, which the slot types will end up on the lower left here, now I can go and enter values for this. So this is the size type, and I want to look for values of uh, maybe tiny, small, medium, and large. And we'll get into these synonyms later, um, but for now, we're basically saying that whenever somebody says one of these utterances, I want a size slot, which is of type, size type, then they can use one of these values, large, medium, small, or tiny, and that's what I'll receive in my skill. Cool. Okay. So other, uh, let's see, energy, and you do the same thing. And my energy type, I'm going to have, what a, is it just high, medium, low? Okay, and then um, let's say temperament. Uh, that is a hard word to type. Temperament type. You have to sound that word out every time I type it. I know. Temperament. I had to look it up earlier today. Yeah. Uh, family friendly. Cool. Cool. All right. So now, what do we got? We have an intent, pet match. Mm -hmm. We have a bunch of utterances. And, and notice the relationship of these. If I was, let me go back to the web world or the mobile world. Let's say I have a button that's the OK button. And when I click the OK button, it calls the OK function. Right? So my label matches what I'm trying to do. And, and the designer picks that one label. And what it's, the burden is on the customer to say, OK, or OK is the closest fit to what I'm trying to accomplish right now. In voice, they could say OK, sure, yes, next, carry on, love it check, whatever. They can say a bunch of things. So this set of utterances is what allows us to match what people are saying into an intent. And then that intent then comes back into you. So that's where the natural language understanding part gets resolved. OK. So now what do we got to do? We've got the slots. We've got, oh, we got to make it required. Yeah, right? so we haven't done anything around dialogue management yet. All we've right. done is define an intent with slots. And so if we just stop right here, we would be uh, on our own. We'd have to go and code Everything to, every time the NLU thought it found a pet match intent, it would send us what it thought it had, and then we'd have to basically build our own multi turn and we would have no help on sort of accuracy from the NLU. So what we can do is use dialog management by over on the right here where it lists the slots, I can select which slots are going to be required. In this case, I actually want all of them. We want to go and say we want, we want the size, we want the energy, and we want the temperament. Yep. So one way to think of this is you've probably got a database to call. Like, we're going to eventually have to go look up, is this a beagle, right? So it's probably a database call or an API call or something like this. So this is where you start to mesh up together your designers and your engineers, right? Because the output of this is going to be the parameters that you pass in to these queries. So we require all three of these Yep, and parameters. so they're required in this. So what happens is, uh, what's really nice about this is you can specify the order that the system will go and prompt for these. I'm just going to leave the default order. Um, and then if I click on one of these, then I can start to build the, what we call prompts and utterances that we're expecting for each one of those. So um, you'll get a little bit of detail here. So this is the size slot. It's slot, slot type, size type. We are requiring it. That's what the yes is for. And so it just gives us a little prompt here that says, in our skill code, when we see this intent come in, we can send a directive back to the NLU or back to Alexa saying delegate, in which case it will start a dialogue, a multi-turn dialogue, and the NLU will take care of going and filling all your slots for you, all your required slots. So that's pretty nice. But it needs some help. So you want to be able to say, OK, what, what, uh, if size isn't filled in, what do I want Alexa to say? So I'll say, how uh, big of a dog would you like? And then um, would you like a small, medium, or large dog? OK. So we're just going to create a couple of these. And then now, just like your sample utterances are telling Alexa how to find an intent, we're going to tell Alexa how to listen for the response. And what will happen is in the NLU, it's going to narrow what it looks for to just these sample utterances. And so it'll become a lot more accurate than if you were doing this on your own. So uh, I want a. Size one, um, maybe I'll just say, you know, large. I want a 
large dog, something like that. Okay? You can also say I want a big guard dog here. I want a what? A big guard dog, right? Yep. Cool. cool. Okay, so then we have to do the same thing for, uh, for energy. So uh, here we'll say something like, uh, are you high, medium, or low energy dog? We might say something like. Bob, are you from Seattle? Me? Yeah. I'm from Michigan. Oh, okay. I, have a, I just thought you were looking for a high dog, and I thought maybe the. <laughs> That's. <laughs> <laughs> Can we make those jokes here? I don't know. Um, do, you, <laughs> do you have a high, medium, or low activity lifestyle? I don't know if that makes sense. I was an engineer, so. Cool. cool. Uh, and then we're going to just now, we're going to prompt for what are, we, what are we looking for in return. So um, we might say something like, I want a energy. Uh, or uh, maybe they'll just say energy, or maybe they'll just say the word. So one cool. thing to do at this point when you're thinking through all this is have somebody else act like Alexa, and then have somebody else act like a human, and then the two should interact. It's usually easier to act like Alexa than act like a human, in my experience. But if you get those two going together, a lot of this naturalness starts to go. When you write it down, what you're, you're really doing is you're, you're thinking in a way that's designing for the eye, right? So when we write paragraphs or we write sentences or those things, they're constructed in a visual consuming kind of a manner. So let me give you two examples real quick on this. Um, one is, uh, let's say I have a long list of words. There's a, there's a technique called an Oxford comma separated list. So I'd have four things. I might say thing one, comma thing two, comma thing three, and, or comma and, thing four, right? And that makes a ton of sense and it would help make it very readable. But that's not how you do it when you're saying it out loud. Usually, and I actually heard this on NPR the other day, they were talking about owls. And they were talking about owls that are all around the world, and they said these owls are all over the place. They're in North America and South America, as well as Europe and Australia. And so the, the concept there was they were doing a thing called clustering, where you do sets of twos or threes. You might have done this with your phone number, right? Like a set of two digits or a set of three digits, kind of clustering them together. So the difference is designing for your eye versus your ear makes a big difference. So talking this stuff out, is, uh, is pretty key, and you'll find a lot of stuff almost instantly. Are you suggesting that my, my UI is no good? I, I'm not suggesting anything. I think it's great. It's really <laughs> easy to use. I mean, do look at what you've done. Do you want to talk it out? <laughs> yeah, I want to talk it out. You pretend to be human. Do you have a high, medium, or low energy lifestyle, Paul? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, OK, yeah. OK, so we got to do temperament still. So uh, do you, you want a guard dog or a family friendly dog? Um, we'll just, I want a... Oh, yes! It is a bad UI. Yay! All right, I found something. So, what would you answer that? Do you want a guard dog or a family-friendly dog? I heard the tester say over here dog. say yes. <laughs> what? Yes. So, so, you're not doing... Like, that's an example where you'd say, hey, there are a couple different temperaments the dogs can have. Would you like... Would, do you prefer guard or family? Right? So, you could say, do you prefer one or the other? So, um, so just a way this? to, or, or if you give people three choices, they often just will pick one of the three versus the others. Um, or figure out in your skill how to handle that, right? If they say yes at that point, then you're going to have to disambiguate, go forward. All right, so uh, which would you like? How about that? Great. And apparently I can't spell. Okay. okay. Cool. So now where are we at? Uh, so now we have... Uh, the intent. Intent built. Yep. So um, the model's building right now, by the way. It'll just kind of give a little status up here. So we have a bunch of sample utterances. We um, think about like somebody who likes to kind of tell us everything at once, or maybe they just know that they want a big dog. We've got three different slots defined. We've defined our slot types. And uh, under the types, we have for, let's see, Size, large, medium, small, tiny. Great. Low, medium, high, and temperament. So um, those are pretty good. Okay. Okay. So, so let's go let's see, see it work. Shot. Alexa, open Pet Match. Welcome to Pet Match. I can help you find the best dog for you. 
What are two things you are looking for in a dog? I want a big guard dog. Sorry, I don't know that. Alexa, open pet match. Bob, cover your microphone when you're talking. Welcome to pet match. I can help you find the best dog for you. What are two things you are looking for in a dog? I want a big dog. What size and temperament are you looking for in a dog? Big and high energy. I forgot those. You gotta cover your mic. Oh, is that right? It's hearing, it's hearing the, the, like, remember I was telling you about beam forming before? Yeah. So what's happening is there's speakers all the way around and we're getting this echo back. So it's actually dampening down the words he's using to use it. So if you say it without Alexa, covering your microphone, it'll open have pet a match. Question. Welcome to Pet Match. I can help you find the best dog for you. What are two things you are looking for in a dog? I'd like a big dog. What size are you looking for? Big. What size are you looking for? Large. Are you looking for a high, medium, or low energy dog? Ah. Awesome. Which would you like a family friendly dog or a guard dog? So a large, family friendly, high energy dog sounds good for you. My database didn't have a recommendation, but I love Hungarian Vizslas. I got this. Okay. Get a Catahoula. No, I have a so let's explain I have a the bug. At home, and so we have a pretty nice database. Let's, of let's dogs. explain the bug that just happened there because yeah. it actually leads us really well yeah. in the next part of the conversation. So what Bob was saying was, I want a big, big dog. Big dog. And if you go back to slot type, size type, mm -hmm. there's no big. As soon as he said large, it sort of kicked on through. So what he wanted to say was big, uh, but he actually says large. So let's wrap up this part, and then we'll get into fixing that bug. I'm glad you did that. That was totally planned, right? Yeah, totally planned. Good work. <laughs> All right. So remember before I talked about this frame-based dialogue, right? And so I want to just sort of put everything you just saw together into that same model. So we, the first question is entrance criteria. Well, we didn't really have any. It's the start of the skill. So we don't need that. We come into the skill. We have three required slots size, energy, and temperament, and each of them has an associated prompt, right? What size would you like? What energy level you like? So forth. Now, if the dialogue is in progress, meaning I don't have all three of those, the system will send it back to our skill. So our skill's doing work in the white versus in the orange is what the Alexa service is doing for you. So it says, oh, dialogue in progress, send the response back. My skill now gets the information and says, okay, cool, I got the size slot or whatever, whatever happened it now knows about. And you could choose to do some logic right then. So for example, if somebody said, um, I'm in Redmond, Washington, I could grab that information, go uh, out to some API and get the zip code, get the zip code back from the API, put it into the, in, into the slots, so now the customer doesn't have, we don't have to ask the customer for it. But later, if they gave us the zip code, we could do the reverse, right? So you can do logic right there. But in our case, we don't do any logic there. Instead, we just say, cool, thank you, delegate. Just send it back to Alexa, and Alexa will do the next thing. Okay, so really, it's just about delegating. Um, the, the zip code example I gave was what we call an illicit slot. So you'd say, I want to, um, no, actually, it's not, because that, in that case, I'm just filling in the intents. The illicit slot version is, if there's a very specific slot I want right now, or I want to dynamically change the prompt in my code, I can then go illicit. I, I want the size right now, and I'm going to ask it in this particular way. So illicit allows you to do that. All right, so then you keep looping through, and... And literally all we're doing is we're getting the intent, sending it back, getting the intent, sending it back. When it's all done, it comes out with dialogue complete. We say, cool, thank you. We can trust all the data that's in there because we've gone through this process here. And then we go call my API or call the database, right? Okay, so and in fact, what was is. happening there was it would say, you said big, mm -hmm. and it came out the bottom and it said that was not a match, right? We got, we got a a value, but not a matching value to one we know. So we're not going to send that to our API because our API is not going to know what to do with it. If it was something you didn't really care about, like maybe you're just doing a search, right? So you could take big and go, well, I don't know. I got a word. I don't really know what the word is, but I'll send it off to my search engine and it'll do its thing. That's fine too. But in this case, we want to know because we're going to do a database lookup. All right. So Bob, why don't you show off a couple things? Great. Thank you. All right, mic check. Okay, cool. So let me show off a couple real world, real world examples of what some of our customers are doing around dialogue management. I'm going to start off showing CenturyLink. Check this out. Alexa, start CenturyLink. Welcome to the CenturyLink skill. 
You can ask me things such as, what makes us a global leader in IT? Or who is CenturyLink? Or for a list of commands, please say help. What would you like to do? Alexa, what's the value between CenturyLink and VMware? Through time and experience, CenturyLink has learned how important it is to partner with the right people, since the right technology and partner can help your company succeed both now and in the future. That's why CenturyLink and VMware decided to join forces. By working together, they provide powerful solutions to help you achieve your business objectives. Would you like to know more? No. Thank you. Return soon to learn more about CenturyLink. Alexa, home. I use that as an example, not to give you the CenturyLink pitch, but to show you at the end, it asked us, do you want to learn more? I said no. I could have said yes, but because I said no, it then had another message for me, right? So that's just illustrating the different kind of back and forth that you could have with dialogue management and those different options. Now you could build that out using a graph or a frame UI like we just saw earlier above. It's depending on how you want to uh, guide your conversation. Now I'll give you another good example that uses uh, some dialogue management and uh, some really cool uh, event response under the hood. Alexa, start Harlem Globetrotters. Introducing the Harlem Globetrotters. Good to see you again. I can test your Harlem Globetrotter trivia skills or show you the player roster. What would you like to do? Enter the contest. What's your 10-digit phone number? 314-555-0500. So, if you win, I can contact you at 314-555-0500, okay? Yes. You have entered the contest. For complete rules, visit harlemglobetrotters.com. Thanks for entering. Good luck. Alexa. I can tell you about... Goodbye. For a list of things I can do. Sure, go ahead. Say help. Is my mic on? Yeah? Okay. A couple of interesting things that are in there that uh, were a little bit subtle. One is there's a screen. You're looking at an Echo Show. It has a screen on it. Um, one thing to think about design tip for this is think about it like uh, as a part of your conversation, right? So if you are having a conversation with somebody back and forth, it's often nice to take out a napkin and start jotting down something to sort of like uh, capture memorable moments or to make a point, have another person correct something back and forth. But if I take that napkin and give it to somebody else on its own, it's actually not really interesting. It was really a, an artifact of that conversation we just had. And the way that Bob and the team have used the UI is just like that. So you could actually just have the full conversation and do everything with your back to the Echo Show, cooking something or whatever you might be doing. Mm -hmm. But then if you turn back, there's a little bit of extra context there. And so it's a really powerful way to reinforce the conversation. Oh, huge. Um, huge. And I think that's what I hope you're all taking away from reInvent this week is learning the different options on how you can design voice and visual conversations on the Amazon Alexa platform. You know, when the Alexa, I'm sorry, when the Echo Show came out on June 28th, we had to pivot our entire business because we saw the value in delivering rich visual and voice experiences for our customers, right? So if you, I could, we'll show you some uh, demos a little bit later of how the text will scroll on the screen or using the different templates that they provide, you can really provide a better experience. And I want to really just emphasize, guys, this, what we're, you have to think of the big picture, right? Alexa is built into the Fire tablets. It's built into your phone. Amazon has it built into the TV. Sony's putting into their new TV line. It's built into BMW cars. You're going to use these skills through an ubiquitous experience anywhere, everywhere to get this information and perform tasks on demand. You know, so what we showed you might have you know, been really good dialogue management, but you have to understand you're going to engage this stuff anywhere. Everywhere. So one other thing that uh, I want to point out there design-wise was you use something called SSML, which is Speech Synthesis Markup Language. Yes. And that allowed you to have the whistling at the beginning for the globetrotters with an audio file. 
It also allowed Alexa to have different inflections. So at one point she says, all right, or no, she said, good luck. That's right. right. She had a little bit of an inflection. It's called a speech con. Uh, punctuation, like question marks, will change the inflection. Uh, you, can, you can get down to the phenome level. You can use uh, this, this system called IPA to change how it sounds phonetically. So you can say pecan versus pecan. Right? Mm -hmm. Or picant in my case. You know, we also have some of our customers ask us to slow down or speed up some of the messages. Prosody. You know, exactly. So that way on the welcome message, they've got a little bit more of a break in between that uh, offering. Awesome. Yeah. All right, should we get into entity resolution? Yes. Uh, <coughs> such an amazing feature. Well, so this, is a, this is a feature that I introduced so well in my demo that didn't look like it was going <laughs> so well. Can I look quicker? So uh, as I demonstrated, you don't always, not everyone says the same thing to mean the same words, right? And so again, we've been speaking for a very long time. We know that every word has synonyms. And so when you're looking for a certain value from somebody, it's possible they're going to say something else. I just did it to myself, right? So, uh, and I demoed it that way this morning, by the way, too. So in this case, if I'm looking for a size, how many different ways can I say small? Several. I could say tiny. I could say small, um, mini, petite, little. So those are all synonyms that we want to match to the slot value that I'm looking for, which is small. And then the same might be true for tiny, medium, and large. And so because we know that these synonyms exist, we have a feature in Alexa called Entity Resolution. And so when you're developing your skill and you're building the model, you can go and define synonyms for your slot types so that it's not just a couple of values that maybe sometimes trips up your users, but now you can start looking for those synonyms as well. And so what will happen under the hood is Alexa will resolve one of those synonyms to the actual value that you're looking for. And so you'll say, I'm looking for tiny, and the user might say mini, petite, or teacup, and it'll show you, it'll send to your skill what the user said, as well as what it resolves to. Now one of the interesting things is notice that tiny and small both have the word mini in them. And so there are some times where those synonyms actually mean a couple different things. And we're going to rely on the model again to take care of this for us. And so the NLU will come in and say, if I say I want a mini dog, then a prompt might go back to the user and say, you said mini, do you want a tiny or a small dog? And then I'll say tiny or small. And then that will resolve to tiny or small and then send that back to me. I'll still know what the user said so that I can go and improve my model if I need to after that. And so then optionally, something go ahead. like, oh, if you're interested in a big dog, you might try a large breed. So you can actually use both words. You can use your canonical and what the user said. So let's just uh, take cool. this for a spin real quick. OK. So, so I'd love, uh, should, we get, should we get from the audience? Yeah. All right. Let's throw out some uh, sizes. You want to do sizes first? Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Give me a size. Gigantic. You're going to have to go fast, Bob. Yep. Another size. Huge. Huge. Massive. Massive. I heard itty bitty from the back. Itty bitty. I love it. Enormous. Enormous. What? Epic. What? Grande. Grande. Wow, that's interesting. Grande chihuahua. I like that. What was that? 20 pounds. I love this one. What about a... Uh, a lap dog? Is that, would a lap dog be a tiny or a small dog? I would put that at a medium, to be honest. Medium, be a medium, medium or a small, right? I mean, I, my visa is a lap dog. Okay, so, so let's, let's pause on this 20 pounds one for just a second. I think it's an awesome one. Here's how we would actually build this. So the AKC, the AKC actually has size ranges for dogs, right? They have weight ranges and height ranges, and that will help us classify what's going on. But it doesn't really make much sense to put 20 pounds here, because what if somebody says 21 pounds, right? Or over 20 pounds, or under 20 pounds. There's a few things you could say here. So what I would actually do in this situation is I would create another set of slots. I would create a slot around an amount, which could be a number, right? 20 in this case, but it could be 15 or whatever, 120, which is where you should go. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would have another slot for the units. Like I might want pounds, or I might want ounces, right? I might want kilos, stones, whatever it might be, okay? And then I want to have a third slot that's going to be greater than or less than. So it'll be like an operator. I want to say greater than, less than. So then I would say greater than 20 pounds, right? And I would have the, um, the greater than, I, I would have entity resolution like this for synonyms to say more, less, uh, bigger than, whatever, right? All that kind of stuff. So now what happens is my skill gets that information. It's going to get 20 pounds, bigger than 20 pounds. And I go, ooh, I know what this is. It's the information I need to go look up in this table that I have to go figure out what size is that. 
I look up the size, get the size back, shove it into the size slot, so now the user doesn't have to give it to me. I say, now that's a small. So that's how you'd go through and build that whole situation. And the only logic I put in my code is to do the lookup in the table. OK? So I I'm, keep trying to break it. That was an awesome one. All right. Should we move on to another type? Energy? Uh, sure. Let's get some more. I'm going to do like average sized, um, medium sized. OK, so cool. He just added a phrase here. So instead of saying, I want a medium dog, you might say, I want a medium sized dog. And for like, I want a large dog kind of makes sense. I want an average sized dog makes sense. So you kind of fix the phrasing a little bit. And it, so it doesn't have to be a true synonym. It just has to be an equivalent of what the person might say. And I just added mini under both small and tiny, just so we can kind of see what that's like later. Maybe, so. maybe miniature would be another good one. I added miniature under small. I miniature. watched the, uh, the dog show over Thanksgiving. You know another one I might put here? We actually saw this this morning in the workshop. Um, what people were, people were saying this, and what Alexa hear, was hearing was minute instead of mini. Was what? And so in the logging, minute. Minute. So what, in, what we did is in the, we went through the logs, and we said, wow, a lot of people are saying minute. But they were really saying mini. Right? So then we go, oh, that's now a synonym for mini. We'll throw a minute in here. And that helps us do error correction and things sure. like that over time. So I'll put them in both in because we're looking for mini under both of these. Love it. And of cool. course, there's no minute dog, but it comes back as small and we're on our way. Yeah. All right. How about, uh, so how about energy type? Yep. What's Hyper. Hyper, Real quick, that'd ahead. be high energy, right? Yeah, for sure. I know all about that. Minute. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Minute. Wait, minute is an energy? You could actually do that, by the way, with the, with the um, phenomes. You could. You could Actually, check the, the uh, pronunciation. Okay, uh, energy levels. Give me some energy levels. Bouncy. bouncy. Would one. they wait? Bouncy. What? Cuddly. Good. I love Ooh, cuddly. Yeah. Would cuddly. cuddly be probably like low energy? Low energy. Something. Yeah. How about how about likes to cuddle? Likes to cuddle. Others. Laid back. Hyper. Laid back. Laid back. Laid back. Uh, crazy. <laughs> crazy. I do not want a crazy dog. I think I heard. Chill how about how about uh, a dog that likes to run? A dog that likes to run. I like that. Chillax. Chillax, nice. I, I don't know if, what about that two one. two L's in chillax. Uh, <laughs> uh, wait, louder. Oops. Hold on, I misspelled that one. Energetic. Easy. Good one, good one. Good one. Uh, How about, I'd like a dog to play frisbee with. Supercharged. Oh, you got, everyone in this audience wants either a high energy or a low energy. Yeah, you're like, woo, let's no, go. Right? Uh, what did you say, uh, that I can play frisbee with? Yeah. Play frisbee with. How about? Uh, I heard smart. It's interesting. Hmm. Mellow. Yeah. Jeez, so like for more. low energy, Mellow. I would like to have a dog that I could sit on the couch and watch Netflix with. So we could literally put in sit on the couch and watch Netflix with. What's that? Nothing. It was really good if I heard it the first time, right? That's how it can't. Not repeatable. All right. Cool. All right, do we have this one squared yeah, away? Yeah, let me get a couple more sort of on the media help to uh, play fetch with. Nice. And even keeled. Tug of war. Even keeled? Yeah. How do I spell keeled? Is that keeled? Double E. Sweet. All, All right, right. Temperament. temperament. Ooh. Family, Family friendly. Mm. Family friendly. What, what out there? Guard dogs are easier, right? Good so with kids. Oh, good with kids. I like that one. Uh, would I say good with kids or that's good with kids? Um, both. Good with kids. Good with kids. Doesn't bite. That doesn't. Did bite. you say ugly? I, I keep hearing um, ugly. <laughs> Cuddly? Cuddly. Well, good with other dogs. Cuddly, yeah. Cuddly. Did someone say that doesn't lie? <laughs> that doesn't lie? Nice. I thought I heard that from the audience. Apparently, it's really hard to hear up here. OK. So, Protective uh, protect uh, to protect us. How about uh, scares other people, <laughs> goes Attacked after squirrels. Goes after squirrels. All right, we should get moving on. Goes barks at the doorbell. To scare strangers away, yeah. OK. All right. All right. So. Um, I shouldn't have built my model yet because I think we're going to have to add some more utterances here, right? Do you think? Or um... no, I don't think so. Uh, like I want to, I want an energy, energy dog. Like I want a. Oh, you might. Let's think about this. So, I want a. 
Small dog that I can nap with. How about I that? I want a small dog I can nap with. Okay. I want a small dog. So I would say I want a size dog uh, that I that I think temperament. That was energy, right? Yep. Nice. Okay. Um, and then just for the heck of it, I'm going to say I want help finding a dog. Because now you're going to be able to say, uh, you know, we can go and see what the, the slot confirmation order is in um, and watch it go through all, all three of them. Cool. Okay, so now we're going through and building again. So what's happening right now is it's taking all the possibilities here, it's expanding out all the different variations of all the words we have, compiling that into training data, and then sending that off to the NLU. Uh, to get built out. This is the kind of thing I was talking at a, another conference where, they, where they've been doing voice for 20 years. And this is where they, they would go through and they edit their grammars and stuff. And it would take a long time to go change your grammars out. So this is kind of a cool thing that it's, uh, it's done in a couple minutes. Yeah, so I'm just looking to see. And this is, like Paul said, this, sometimes this will take some time because then you'll, uh, when, you're, when you're iterating around this model, because you might go through and look at, OK, uh, and and we've, we've seen some tricks in the past where you might create additional slots that'll take care of some of these in-between words. So I have a dog that I can nap with. I might have just said, I can nap with. Yeah, an example of that is I could right here have a slot. See how we have I want, I want, I'd like, I prefer? We could actually have a slot that's a, a preface or a preamble, right? And it could say, I would like, I'd like, I want, find me, uh, let's get, exactly, all those different kinds of phrases. And my code, I'm never even going to look at that because I just don't really care what it is. And it's not a required slot. It would just allow the user to say a whole variety of things for me not to have to create all the possible uh, variations. So it's a good way to e expand out your utterances. All right, let's take it, let's take it for a spin. I'm just going to take right, the let's do it. Alexa, open Pet Match. Welcome to Pet Match. I can help you find the best dog for you. What are two things you are looking for in a dog? I want help finding a dog. How big of a dog would you like? Huge. Do you have a high, medium, or low activity lifestyle? I want a dog that I can nap with. Which would you like, low or high? High. I didn't create that utterance. Are you looking for a guard dog or a family-friendly dog? One that barks at the doorbell. So a large guard high energy dog sounds good for you. Consider a Doverman Pinscher. Yes. Nice. Very cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Which one? This one? Who has the clicker? I don't have the clicker. Uh, it's right here. We're going to have to roll fast because it says yeah, we, we have two, two minutes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So let's give you guys some real world practical examples. I'm going to have to cut this like crazy, crazy short because we've only got two minutes. So I got to first disclaim it. Um, this is brand new. Don't sue us. That's all I can say. <laughs> oh, boy. And I'll also say, Elon, if you like this, call me. You're supposed to tell us about these before yeah, we go Yeah, stage. check this out. Well, well, we had this really good demo, but then we wanted to, like, one-up it. So this is, this is reInvent. Y'all got to, like, go home. Wow. Check this out. Alexa, start Tesla. Welcome to the Tesla skill for Amazon Alexa. At Tesla... We believe the faster the world stops relying on fossil fuels and moves towards a zero emission future, the better. I can do such things as tell you about a Tesla model or help you schedule a test drive. What would you like me to do? Tell me about the Roadster. Roadster is the quickest car in the world, with record-setting acceleration, range and performance. From 0 to 60 miles per hour in 1.9 seconds and a top speed exceeding 250 miles per hour. The Roadster boasts an Alexa. impressive 600. I love it. Schedule a test drive. What date? Tomorrow. What time? 9 a.m. What is your name? Bob. What's your last name? Stolzberg. What is your phone number? 314-397-2610. <laughs> so... You want to schedule a test drive on November 28, 2017 at 9 o'clock for the Roadster. Your name is Bob Stoltzberg and you can be contacted at 
397-2610. Okay? Yes. Thank you for scheduling your Tesla test drive. I can tell Alexa. you about the nearest... Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Hope to see you soon in your very own Tesla. Wow, that's insane. It is insane. <laughs> we showed you guys. If you're interested in the product, tell me about your products and services. And if I'm interested, I'll give you my info. That, call, that literally goes to a database, to a sales rep. They're going to call me tomorrow or confirm it. Like, that's how we're going to engage in the future. Wrap up. All right. I'm going to show one slide with the interrupt. Let's do the, oh, we skipped all those completely. Okay, oh, yeah. great. Uh, I just want to show you one slide real quick, just to wrap up, just to put a fine point on what we were talking about there. Uh, here. So this is the kind of thing that you'll see in your code. You get a JSON response. Um, what the person said was mini. We got an ER success match, and it came back with an array of tiny or small, and that's how you can know to disambiguate, okay? And you know that it's a value that's in the list. If it was a no match, you would get this example. So like itty bitty might be a no match, although we happen to have that one. And then I can go through and then log that and then let, add itty bitty to my thing or I can, or I can disambiguate or whatever I might want to do. Okay. So with that. We have a special surprise. We were going to do the first official, unofficial Alexa world record. But we just didn't have the runway to do it. We're going to have to do it in the future. Um, Instead, we're going to give away an Echo Dot courtesy of Voice XP. And it's a really fun way. I got to give the props to world famous Alexa evangelist Jeff Blankenberg for this. If you want to win, stand up. All right, all right. Nice, nice. We're going to play a game. I love that. We're going to play a game. If you want to win, stand up. All right, here we go. If, here's how it works we're going gonna, gonna, gonna to flip a coin, but you got to put your hands on your head. Or your butt. It's heads or tails, guys. Heads or tails. We're going to see how fast we can liquidate this room Here. in this contest. Keep this one. This one. Okay. Thank you. So put your hands on your head or your butt. Alexa, flip a coin. Flipping. It's heads. It's heads. So if heads. you have your hands on All your right. butt, sit down. All right. All right. Put them in a new position. We're going to do it again. Alexa, heads or tails? Alexa. Heads or tails? You've got tails. No, oh, a lot of heads. Sit down. Oh. If you're hit tails, keep standing. All right, put them where they need to be. Alexa, flip a coin. I flipped a coin and got tails. Ooh, oh. how many people are still standing now? I only think we've got four or five. Four or five, all right. All right, all right. Alexa, flip a coin. I flipped a coin and got tails. Ooh. Oh. Who's left? Down I can't to two. See. two. Two. All right. Alexa. Come, yeah, come up, wait, come up front. You too. Yeah, come, come up front. front. Come, come up front. front. Excuse me. <laughs> Here we, we go. We got the Seattle Seahawks jersey. Yeah. Yes. All right. That guy. <laughs> Way to represent. <laughs> 24 to 13. And luckily, it's not an Amazon employee. All right. 5:30 p.m. And Alexa. Against the Eagle. Stop. <laughs> do All right. All right. Final round. Alexa. Heads. Oh wait. Let me hit the mute button. We'll get you guys ready. You know? Alexa, heads or tails? Alexa, heads or tails? Flipping, it's heads. Ooh. Whoa! Nice, nice. <laughs> um, Thank you, everybody.